Numbers 15, 38 to 40. Speak unto the children of Israel, Yasharalah, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments, fringes, throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Hawa, and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your Creator. All right, so I'm in this book now. It's called uh, Publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, number 11. And we're going to go to page 75 of this book. And it says here, The Jews of New England, other than Rhode Island, prior to 1800, by Leon Hunter A.M. says, The Puritan Revolution in New England had awakened a keen interest in the Jewish race, and this interest was powerfully reflected in early New England history. It is in Massachusetts that this tendency was most strongly exhibited in Massachusetts. Hmm. Hebrew was carefully taught at Harvard College and the restoration of the Jews was one of the most popular topics. The restoration of the Jews, all right? In 1649, Eliot, the missionary announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin. Whoa, what? Yep. John Eliot, right? He also translated one of the first Bibles into the Algonquin language. Actually, the first Bible in the U.S. was in Algonquin. It was done here by, supposedly, by John Eliot. And it says here that in 1649, he announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin. All right. Number two says here the footnote. And it says it's felt ecclesiastical history. All right, so this is the book, The Ecclesiastical History of New England, comprising not only religious, but also moral and other relations by Joseph B. Felt. All right, this is volume two, 1862. All right, on page 12 of this book, it says here, July 8th, Eliot communicates his purpose to Whitfield for translating the Bible into Indian tongue and educating some Indian Jews. All right, so remember I told you, he wrote the first Bible in the Americas. It was actually in Algonquin, complete Bible done in the Algonquin language by John Eliot. All right, and it says here that he was uh, translating the Bible to educate some of the Indian Jews and mentions the need of help from the charitable. He previously communicated his opinion that the Indians here were of Hebrew origin. All right, so it's in here. We verified the source, right? Ecclesiastical history of New England. John Elliot letting you know, right, that the Indians here were of Hebrew origin. All right, why is he saying that? All right, so back in the other book, all right, the American Jewish Society book that we were just reading. So we were able to verify the source, right? Uh, it says in footnotes too. So again, John Elliot in 1649 announced that the Indians were of Hebrew origin in the following year, Downham issued an appeal to Englishmen for contributions to Indian missions on the plea that those of New England were of Jewish descent. All right, they were of what? Hebrew descent. All right, that's three. Again, that's page 17 in the same one, Felt Ecclesiastical History. When in 1650, Thorogood publishes Jews in America, we've read from that, Eliot of Massachusetts at once proclaimed that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel principally applied to the Indians as such use. All right. So John Eliot is letting you know that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel principally applied to the Indians. All right. And stated that the New England churches were the preface to the new ha ha havens. All right. You see what's going on in Massachusetts in the 1600s. We're back in the book, Ecclesiastical History of New England. All right. And page 17, just want to go ahead and verify that. And his appeal for the cause of missions here, the Reverend John Downham addresses his countrymen in England. Come forth, ye masters of money. Part with your gold to promote the gospel. 
that the gift of God in temporal things make way for the Indians' receipts of spirituals. He also takes the ground that the Indians of New England are of Jewish descent. All right? And we're still on the book, uh, page 22, Ecclesiastical History of New England. It says, this year, Mr. Thorogood publishes a treatise. This is page 22. This year, Mr. Thorogood publishes a treatise in England entitled Jews in America, or probabilities that the Americans are of that race. Sewell states that Elliot, the missionary, believed that the 37th chapter of Ezekiel was principally applicable to the Indians as such Jews, and many other parts of scripture, many other parts of scripture apply to the Indians. From the book Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews in the Spanish and Portuguese Discoveries by Dr. M. Kayser Ling. This was written in 1894. And we're in chapter uh, 6 here. It says, Among the explorers, companions whose names have come down to us, the complete list is lost, according to them, right? They don't want us to know who was there. There were several men of Jewish stock, for example, Luis de Torres, again, here we go. Luis de Torres, remember, he was the interpreter. It says, a Jew who had occupied a position under the governor of Murcia and who was baptized shortly before Columbus sailed. As he understood Hebrew, Chaldee, and some Arabic, Columbus employed him as interpreter. Again, another source, as interpreter. So they knew they were going to the old world. So he brought this person, Luis de Torres, just in case, because he knew many languages, but especially Hebrew, because we'll see later that Columbus was looking for the Grand Khan or the Prester John, right? This is from the book, The Secret Archives of the Vatican by Maria Luisa Ambrosini. You can get this in Barnes and Noble, all right? And this was a hard book to get. I had to take a screenshot of every page. It was only on loan. And so it says here, greater than Europe and Africa. The popes had been collecting Hebrew codices since Avignon, Avignon times, and while the count of a voyage a quarter of the way around the world is an odd thing to find in the records of a desert people, there is. So they're saying that, they, that the Vatican and these popes had uh, documents and codices going back, you know, Hebrew codices, stating that they how they traveled the world, right? How they had lands far away. Right? It says, and they called them desert people, but we know they weren't all desert people. There is, when one comes to think of it, a surprising frequency of reference to the sea and its islands in biblical writings, a reflection of desert man's longing for water, or an unacknowledged heritage from the Phoenicians. The document, if it existed, has disappeared, according to them, right? It may be in one of the bundles of unclassified documents in the miscellanea, and it probably definitely is. It may have been destroyed in the sack of Rome in the next century, or the cosmographer friend may simply have given it to Pinzon, who ha would have had no trouble getting it retranslated in Spain, from which Jews had not yet been evicted. The fact that Columbus took with him on his first voyage an interpreter, again, who was converted Jew and skilled in Hebrew, though he knew only a little Arabic, suggests that he may have attached importance to the legend. All right, so even the Vatican and these people studying these records in the Vatican let you know that Columbus brought this Hebrew interpreter for a reason. He believed in something. All right, just like he wrote that he was going to go recover the holy city and Mount Zion, right? A fragment of supporting evidence comes from Paleobotany. The same variety of cotton was being cultivated both in Peru and in the Indus Valley in 2500 BC. Alright, so here we go again. Peru, right? Peru. So they're saying that we had cotton, right? We were making cotton, growing it, making clothing, right? In Peru, in the same time as the Indus Valley. You know, this is the true old world we've seen before that the all these pyramids are over here, the mummies, you know, this is Atlantis. So we can see that, you know, they're always trying to match something old that happened over here to something on the other side of the world. All right, but we, we know this is the true old world, right? So let's continue. It says, since, since cotton seed is killed by seawater, this may be an indication of intercontinental contact. 
somewhere back in the megalithic age that seems less and less primitive the more we learn about it. The great names of the past crowded around the discovery of America. So it says again, the great names of the past crowded around the discovery of America as ancient writings newly printed were searched for evidence and opinion. Columbus studied Ptolemy, Aristotle, and Pliny. So you see Columbus studying these people because these people are the ones with the legends, right, of Atlantis like Plato and all these other people. So these same people study the, uh, Plato because in other accounts, Columbus is said to be actually a Greek and his name is different than Christopher Columbus if he is a real person. Right? We're going to get to that. But as you can see, there's a lot of Greek influence here. And the Greeks are the ones who wrote about Atlantis, right? Or America. He had a copy of Pope Aeneas Silvius Historia Rerum Ubique Gestarum. The Pope had mo modestly planned a universal history and geography and had completed the section on Asia. He read e Esdras, the prophet of the Apocrypha and was inclined to believe him because St. Ambrose and St. Augustine had thought highly of him. Also, Edras told Columbus what he wanted to hear. His estimate of the Earth's relative proportion of land and water made it seem that the Atlantic would be conveniently narrow. So you see how they're talking about Esdras, right? And we also know that in the book of Esdras is when they talk about the Assyrian captivity and how the, the lost tribes, right, decided to um flee into the wilderness right they separated right so continuing even prince henry the navigator in his research institute of Sa sagris found some of his inspiration and motivation in legend all right so all these legends they had in europe and west africa is really stories of old of atlantis or slash america or the old india or the third ethiopia right the route around Africa was to lead not only to the prosperity of Oriental trade, but to the kingdom of Prester John. Again, Prester John, a.k.a. King David, a.k.a. the Grand Khan, or Wan Khan, into the gardens of the high point of the world. All right, so we just want to go back to this book, uh, Christopher Columbus and the Participation of the Jews. In Cuba, Española, and the other islands which he discovered, Columbus found natives who had their caciques and their own language and traditions. To what race did these aborigines of America belong? Several writers have asserted to have displayed much learning in attempting to prove that the aborigines were descendants of the Jews. Okay, so, alright, so we've been taking this journey, you know, You've seen the uh, Hebrew cover colored up originals uh, video uh, that I made uh, and relating to all the accounts that have uh, basically come from the past uh, of these early settlers, colonists, pilgrims, um, believing and writing in their accounts that they have found the lost tribes in America. You know, and uh, if we know that this is the old world, then. They actually found the old world so they found the tribe that originally were in the old world right or what they have put in the bible in the old testament so-called bible lands all right so as you can see columbus and was also trying to understand this that's why he brought a hebrew interpreter with luis de torres so he can speak hebrew not the jewish jewish of today assyrian uh, mixture but paleo Hebrew which was vibration of original to the Americas that's why they found uh, in New Mexico those lunar stones which is written paleo Hebrew they gave it a date of at least 500 to 2000 years ago I'll study that so let's continue it says this result was reached already in the 16th century by the Spanish clergyman Roldan his arguments were derived from an unpublished manuscript which he discovered in the library of Sao San Pablo in Seville. Montesinos, who possessed the manuscript of Luis Lopez, the learned bishop of Quito, that's in Ecuador, was convinced that the Peruvians were of Jewish origin. The Peruvians, 
And where do we say the city of David was? I just told you, Cusco, Peru. Where is the oldest pyramid in the world? In Peru, Caral Sucre. And there's many others in South America. And where's the oldest mummies found? Chile, Peru. All right, so where are the real cradles of civilization? So again, the Bishop of Quito was convinced that Peruvians were of Jewish origin. The view of Roldan and Gregorio Garcia that the Aborigines of America were descendants of the Jews was maintained with many arguments in one and the same year, 1650, independently by the Englishman Thorogood and by the Portuguese Jew Manasseh ben Israel, a renowned rabbi of Amsterdam who induced Cromwell to allow the Jews to return to England. A Portuguese Marano, here we go again, another Marano of Villa Flor, who, strange to say, also called himself Montesinos and afterwards assumed the name Aaron Levi, informed Manasseh that he had mingled in South America with Jews of the Ten Tribes. Manasseh's book attracted much attention and was translated into Latin, Spanish, Dutch, English, Italian, and Hebrew. And we read a little bit of this book in the other videos uh, that I made. And so we're also going to go back into it in, in future videos. All right. So it says, nor has interest in it ceased even at the present day. One more interest then the mode of migration is the question whether any analogies in language, in traditions, in religious conceptions, or in religious ceremonies justify the accept acceptance of this ethnological theory. Roldan's chief argument in support of his view is the language of the Indians in Hispaniola, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands. He contends that it has many resemblances to Hebrew. Again, Roldan's chief argument in support of his view in the language of the Indians in Española, Cuba, Jamaica, and the adjoining islands, he contends that it was many, has many resemblances to Hebrew. In fact, he even calls it a corrupted Hebrew. Yes, because he doesn't know, understand the ancient paleo, picto, symbol uh, Hebrew, vibrational, right? It's not about words or religion. So, uh, for example, let's take a look at the word Hebrew, right? It's etymology. All right, I don't know if you saw my other videos talking about Eber, right? So it says here in etymology uh, dictionary for the word Hebrew, it says late Old English from Old French Hebrew, 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 from Latin Hebrews, from Greek Hebraeus, from Aramaic Semitic Hebrae, Hebra, Hebra, Hebra. You see that Hebra. Corresponding to Hebrew, Ebri, and the Israelite, traditionally from an ancestral name, Eber. From an ancestral name, Eber. So that's one of the sons of, uh, on the line of Shem. But probably, literally, one from the other side. So really, Hebrew is basically saying, meaning, he is from one from the other side. Perhaps in reference to the river Euphrates, or perhaps simply signifying immigrant from Eber, region on the other or opposite side. So, are you living in the region on the other region or the opposite side from a European's perspective? Is that where America is on the opposite side of Europe and Africa? Yes, right? So, one from the other side, Hebrew, Hebrew, Israelite, so all the different meanings, but really it goes down to basically being one from the other side. So Eber, again, the region beyond, the region beyond. If you remember Ebra, which means in, uh, which means a pinion. So we remember again Ebra, right? Eber, Ebra, which means a pinion. And opinion is basically a feather. Yes, a feather. Ibra. Its root etymology or foundational uh, meaning is feather. Ibra. Who holds feathers to be important and sacred? Who dresses with feathers? It says here, words study feathers and wings. 
The word here for feathers is Ibra, which is often associated with the feathers of a dove. Although I have found it used to reference the feathers of an ostrich or eagle. So as it says here, it says Psalms 91.4 He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. A little bit down. It says, it is interesting that this word Ebra for feathers comes from the Semitic word Eber. Shemitic, Semitic, Shem which means the feathers of a dove. However, it is rooted in the Akkadian word abaru, which is the word for being firm, fixed, strong, immovable. Jewish sages apply this word for the idea of covering for protection. So using feathers as a covering for protection. Again, it's opinion, which is a feather. And so Ibra, we get Hebrew and we also get Abra, Ibrahim, Ibra, Ibrahim. We get Hebrew, Eber, or Ibra, which is feathers. Ibrahim, Abraham. So Abraham is related to feathers as well. So when they're talking about Abraham, who were they really talking about in the ancient Paleo Hebrew? Were they just talking about a priest king? Over here on this side, a chief, Kasike, Katsin, a Katsin, Katsinke, and continues regarding Roldan. He asserts that such names as Cuba and Haiti are Hebrew and that they were first applied by the earliest Kasikes, the chiefs or leaders, Kasin. Alright, we're going to see what he means by that, Kasin, who discovered and peopled the islands. The names of rivers and persons islands the names of rivers and of persons in use among the natives are derived from the hebrew for example hyena from the hebrew ain stream jones from jonah jake from jacob ures from urias siabao from siba maisi from moisi the names of their tools of their little canoes or kansas the name akshi for pepper the name of the storehouse for maize grain and the like all point to the Hebrew language right their rites and ceremonies as well as their language form one of the main arguments in favor of this theory of descent circumcision prevailed among the Indians they often bathed in rivers and streams they refrained from touching the dead and from tasting blood they had definite fast days marriage with sister-in-law was permitted if they were childless widows, wives were discarded for new helpmates. They also sacrificed first fruits on high mountains and under shady trees. They had temples and carried a holy ark before them in time of war. Okay, so they had temples and carried a holy ark before them in time of war. They were also like the ten tribes, including to idol worship, and according to him, idol worship, what he thought of the ten tribes. All writers and travelers agree, moreover, that there were many Jewish types of faiths among the Indian, the Aborigines of America. So again, just want to bring you back to the word that he mentioned as Katsin or Katsike. He was saying Katsike comes from Katsin. What is Katsin? So just in case you, you missed me dropping this on 432thedropradio.com. You know, as it says here, Kasike, 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 Katsin, Chief, Arawakan, Hawakan, drawn by Kuri Mayo. So you can check, I have a little personal channel here. So I invite you to Drop Nation. Tune in every Monday. I have a radio show there as well. Uh, check out the schedule. A great platform, you know, static free, you know, brought to us by the great Khan Drop. There you go. I wanted to see if, uh, how do you say, Chief? in Hebrew and I was able to find this which is Katsin right and you can see the phonetic spelling Katsin Katsin with a K Katsin in the West Indies and in Spanish countries the chiefs are called Kasike Katsin Katsi Ke Katsin Ki Katsike Katsin very similar Again, it says he asserts that such names of Cuba and Haiti are Hebrew and that they were first applied by the earliest caciques. 
cut see the chiefs or leaders cut seen cut seen again is hebrew again cut seen means chief or ruler same thing as in arawak language taino language right cut because Cacique is a Taino or Arawak word. So what are the Arawak really speaking, which who came from South America, right? We're telling you that the ancient Jerusalem was over there in South America, Peru. The Arawak came from South America before they landed in the West Indies. And their word for chief ruler is the same as Hebrew. Cacique, Cacique, Cacique. It's the same. So... Why did Columbus bring in a Hebrew interpreter? Well, he knew why. Again, he wrote he was coming to conquer or take over uh, the holy city in Mount Sinai for the king and queen of Spain. All right, so now we're in this book called Aboriginal Monuments of the State of New York, comprising the results of original surveys and explorations with an illustri illustrative appendix by E. G. Squire. All right, a young, very famous person, says he a foreign member of the British Archaeological Association, member of the American Ethnological Society, the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, the New York Historical Society, the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Historical and Antiquarian Society of Tennessee, etc., etc., all right, by the Smithsonian Institution, 1849, E.G. Squire. All right, he also surveyed the Mississippi Mounds, and he also found Hebrew stuff there. And he's going to let you know what he found here uh, in the state of New York, all right, the, uh, in the Aboriginal Monuments. All right, so we're in chapter uh, six, and it says here, concluding observations. By whom were the Aboriginal Monuments of Western New York erected? And to what era may they be ascribed? The consideration of these questions has given rise to a vast amount of speculation, generally not of the most philosophical, nor yet of the most profitable kind. If the results arrive at have been erroneous, unsatisfactory, or extravagant, it may be ascribed to the circumstance that the facts heretofore collected have been too few in number and too poorly authenticated to admit of correct conclusions, not less than to the influence of preconceived notions, and to that constant leaning towards the marvelous, which is a radical defect of many minds. Rigid criticism is especially indispensable in archaeological investigations, yet there is no department of human research in which so wide a range has been given to conjecture. All right, so you see a lot of this stuff is just guessing, hypothesis they have. He's letting you know, conjecture. Men seem to have indulged the belief that here nothing is fixed, nothing certain, and have turned aside into this field as one where the several rules which elsewhere regulate philosophical research are not enforced, and where every species of extravagance may be indulged and with impunity. I might adduce numberless illustrations of this remark. The Indian who wrought the rude outlines upon the rock at D Titan, little dreamed that his work would ultimately come to be regarded as affording indubitable evidence of Hebrew, Phoenician, and Scandinavian adventure and colonization in America again. Whoa, the Indian, he never thought, right? That's what he's saying. He never dreamed that his work would ultimately come to be regarded as affording indubitable evidence of Hebrew, Phoenician, and Scandinavian adventures and colonization in America, and the builders of the rude defenses of Western New York as little suspected that Celt and Tartar, and even the apocryphal Mada with his ten ships would in this, the 19th century of our faith, be vigorously invoked to yield paternity to their labors. All right, so he's letting you know that this is the true old world. They're finding all these similarities in these mounds, right? Again, this is from the Smithsonian Institute. He's letting you know in thus biddable evidence. So what is indubitable? indubitable. <laughs> it means impossible to doubt, unquestionable and undebatable truth, unquestionable, undoubtable, undisputable. This is undisputable, unarguable, un 
debatable. You cannot debate this. Uncontestable, undeniable, irrefutable, incontrovertible, unmistakable, unequivocal, certain sure. This is a certain sure, positive, definite, absolute, conclusive, emphatic, emphatic, categorical, compelling, watertight, clear, clear cut. All right. And there's more. All right. So let's go back <laughs> again. All right. It's indubitable evidence, indubitable, unquestionable, a certain fact. This is undebatable. All right. That these monuments, all right, have outlines of evidence of Hebrew, Phoenician, what they call Phoenician, right? It's just the same paleo Hebrew. What are Phoenicians? Canaanites? Moabites? What are they? They all got kicked out of here. But we got the Smithsonian Institution letting us know, all right? It's undebatable what they found here, all right? This is from 1849. All right, back in the book, American Jewish Historical Society, number 11. And in the notes here again in this book, as it is curious to note also the strange arguments employed to prove the Indians of Jewish origin. Thus, in connection with the settlement of Salem in 1626, we read that it was called by the Indians Nahum Keiki. All right, so remember, I think in part three, I talked about this. We read what it meant. It meant the place of Salem, a place of haven, a haven, a place of peace, a place of peace. Nahum Keiki, like a Salem, right? So the word is, wasn't named by any European, they already had that um, name for that place in their language, Nahum KK. White says the opinion is held by some of that Indians might formerly have had some intercourse with the Jews. However, it be it falls out that the name of the place with which our late colony has chosen for their seat proves it to be perfect Hebrew, being called Nahum KK. I told you that's a Hebrew word and it means place of uh, a haven a place of peace or salem by interpretation the bosom of consolation all right so he's letting you know that no european came here and named that place salem the indians already had that name for that area in their own paleo ancient ibari of language whatever you want to call it it's, it's labeled hebrew today right but we're talking about the mother tongue all right, so it was named Nahum KK by them. It was already called Salem. All right, Cotton Matter also says of which place I have also somewhere met with an odd observation that the name of it was rather Hebrew than Indian. For Nahum signifies comfort and cake means haven. And our English not only found it a haven of comfort, but happened also to put a Hebrew name upon it, for they called it Salem, for the peace they had and hoped in it. And so it is called unto this day. So in reality, you know what they named it Salem because they asked the Indians what Nahum Cake meant. And so like, oh, this is a Salem. And they knew it was Hebrew. So they just named it in English. All right. So we continue in the book, American Jewish Historical Society, number 11, page 76, says when in 1650, great mortality occurred among the colonists, it was supposed to be the preparation for the calling of the Jews. This subject engrossed the leading mind, and Roger Williams, sending a pamphlet on the subject to Winthrop in 1654, says, I pray you read this, Jew. By 1665, the view was generally held in Massachusetts, at least, that the outcasts of Israel were about to be gathered together. And the great number of works published on that topic at that period in Massachusetts alone is simply amazing. This was what they were talking about. Why were they talking about this only during that period in Massachusetts? What else is going on in the 1600s? Aren't they sending Pequots and enslaving the Indians as well? Sending the Pequots away? A lot of the uh, uh, native tribes up there in New England, in Massachusetts, weren't they doing that also? All right, but they're also talking about what the Indians were and who they were. And it was a big topic. It was simply amazing how much information how, how popular this topic was at that time. All right, just a quick reminder of something we mentioned before. And you, so you can see as well again, and we have here letters of um, William Penn, right? The founder of Pennsylvania says here, a letter from William Penn, proprietary governor of Pennsylvania in America to the Committee of the Free Society of Traders. 
all right and uh, recently darkman uh, read this out to everybody just want to remind one part here as well uh who we talking about right when we're talking about you know so-called indians right and um it says here uh, as william penn told us as the natives i shall consider their persons language manners religion and government with my sense of their original for their persons they are generally tall straight well built and of singular proportion they thread strong and clever and mostly walk with a lofty chin of complexion black right or dark skin black but by the sign as the gypsies in england gypsy was that just another word for egyptian gypsy egyptian but we're talking about the original that came from here ancient egypt was over here all right so yeah it does look like the ancient uh, gypsies of england because they were talking about red indians if you read ancient britons another book they'll tell you who the gypsies are they called them red indians they greased themselves with beer's fat clarified and using no d defense against the sun or weather their skins must need be swarthy all right so since they don't use no sunblock or anything like that their skin needs to be swarthy or dark skin so they could be protected right with melanin all right so swarthy is again dark skin black dark complexion swarthy now I just focus on the bottom we're talking about hebrew stuff right and uh you know he also said here in the bottom as you can see it says their language is lofty just narrow but like the hebrew but like what like the hebrew we're talking about the lenape delaware tribe he was amongst all right this is the treaty he did with them famous painting all right He's saying that their language is like the Hebrew. Now, remember, what did we learn about Hebrew? Those from the other side, Ibra, feather, feathers up, right? Those who are from the other side, those from beyond the Euphrates, those who crossed, the immigrants, right? All right, so it's not just like a religion, right? So insignification, full, like shorthand and writing. One word serves for in place of three. And the rest are supplied by the understanding of the hearer. Imperfect in their tenses, wanting in their moods, participle, adverbs, conjunctions, interjections. I have made it my business to understand it, that I might not want to interpret on any occasion. And I might say that I know not a language spoken in Europe that has words of more sweetness or greatness and accent and emphasis than theirs. All right, like the Hebrew, William Penn. All right, so real quick, as we're talking about William Penn, and we're in this other book, which is called An Authentic History of Lancaster County in the State of Pennsylvania by J.I. Mombert D.D., member of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. This is written in 1869. All right. All right. So I just want to show you that this is recorded here as well, that he said that the natives, again, were of complexion black, but by design like the gypsies and their skin must need be swarthy swarthy all right just wanted to show you and again their language is lofty yet narrow but like the hebrew like the hebrew so you can see this is actually recorded authentic history all right but i want to show you one more thing so we're on page 68 of the same book authentic history of lancaster county in the state of pennsylvania and again they're reading off uh william penn's letters and uh, notes and he says here it says note number uh 26 it says for their original I am ready to believe them of the Jewish race or Hebrew, right? Hebrew, those from the other side, the feathers, Ibra, Eber. All right, I mean of the stock of the 10 tribes. And he don't just mean any kind of Jewish, right? <laughs> Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Canaanite, you know, uh, Moabite, you know, Ishmaelite, you know, he, not, he don't mean all the Jewish uh race he just means the stock of the 10 tribes the lost 10 tribes israelites jasharala right the sons of jacob in the next place i find them of the like countenance and their children of so lively resemblance that a man would think himself in duke's place or berry street in london when he sees them so he's saying if you know this if you know the history of this place he's talking about uh in london this is actually a Jewish colony, a uh, Jewish town in Berry Street in London. It's all Jew Jews there. So he's saying he feels like when he's seeing the American Indian children playing, how they interact with each other, he feels like he's seeing the same thing when he sees the Jews in uh, Duke's Place or Berry Street in London. All right? He, he says right here. But this is not all. They agree in rights. So their rights as well. 
They reckon by moons. They offer their first fruits, right? They have a kind of Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Tabernacles, all right? That's the real Thanksgiving, the Feast of Tabernacles. They are said to lay their altar upon 12 stones. They're mourning a year, customs of women, with many other things that do not now occur. All right, so William Penn is letting you know he knows they are of the Israelite or <laughs> of the L Ten Lost Stripe stock. All right, the Lenape Delaware Indians he encountered. Uh, we're going to read from uh, this book it's called A Diary in America with Remarks on Its Institutions, Part Second. It says by Captain Marriott CB in three volumes. This is volume three and made in 1839 right mexico and central america abound in curiosities exemplifying the fact of the asiatic origin of the inhabitants and it is not many years ago that the ruins of a whole city with a wall nearly seven miles in circumference with castles palaces and temples again castles and palaces and temples evidently of hebrew or Phoenician architecture was found on the river Palenque. All right, we're going to get into this foreign quarterly review. 